Grab, fix, grab, fix. Oh yes. How low can I go? <laughs> yeah. Get ready to grab it. <laughs> So recently I've seen a lot of breakdown videos on YouTube and thought it would be really cool to do the same but with game development. Now I've been doing game development for around 10 years now, so I've seen everything from the highest of high-end graphics to graphics that maybe aren't so great. So let's jump right into it and start with one of my all-time favorite games, Ratchet and Clank. So here we're looking at the PlayStation 2 version compared to the PlayStation 4 version of the first Ratchet and Clank. Now I think Ratchet and Clank is actually the perfect example of a game that has evolved in a really cool way with technology. So if we look at this clip right here, there's of course a massive change. Without a doubt, the most important thing is the change in lighting. In the first clip, we see pretty much no directional lighting at all. Everything is just ambient lighting, which means that all the objects are lit equally from all directions. And there's pretty much not a single shadow in this shot other than Ratchet himself. However, in the new version, there's a very clear direction to the light, which helps bring depth to the scene. And pretty much all the entities or objects have shadows. But really, one of the most amazing things here is just the sheer amount of objects that are in the new version. In the first version, we have a few trees scattered around, we have a few rocks lying about, and just a few um, kind of animated objects or enemies. In the second version, we have a huge amount of foliage, we have ships flying around, we have particles going off. All the stuff rendered on screen is just due to the new graphics capabilities that we have. We would never have been able to put that much stuff in a single shot before. So, of course, that's pretty cool. All right, so let's continue. All right, so a, a really big difference that we see here is kind of the difference in materials or shaders. And this refers in game development to kind of the look and feel of a surface. Now, we of course see all the same lighting differences here, and especially the fact that we have this many screws and bolts flying around, but the main difference here is definitely the quality of the materials. And what do I kind of mean by this? Well, if we look at the old school Ratchet and Clank, every surface reflects the same amount of light. In fact, it reflects pretty much no light. It's just completely flat. This is fine for stuff like dirt, and the difference in dirt between the two isn't really that big, but when we come to stuff like metals, shining light off metals is extremely important for us to be able to understand it as a metallic surface. Take, for example, the armor of this character right here. So in the original version, it's completely diffuse. It doesn't look like metal. However, in the new version, we have all these specular reflections that give the appearance of that particular piece of armor being different than, the, say, the body or the ground. This is really, really important, and it's something that we've seen a huge shift in. In fact, we now refer to this as PBR, a physically based rendering, because we define the properties and differences in materials based on real physical properties. It's Really cool. And when Ratchet starts to fight this boss, we can also see something else happening, which is emissive materials. Because in the first version, the lava seems, well, pretty dull. And the reason for this is that it doesn't cast light onto the surroundings. And so it doesn't feel like glowing and dangerous lava. It just feels like another kind of shade of dirt. And this is pretty much the same thing happening with metal, but lava doesn't just reflect light, it casts it onto its surroundings, so it's even clearer here. And when you combine this with a post-processing effect like bloom, which pretty much just takes the bright parts of an image and kind of blurs them out to give the impression that they're glowing onto the camera, we really start to see this effect come to life. In fact, I did the same thing for a game that I made recently using just these techniques, emissive materials and bloom. Okay, <laughs> I can see what's, what's going to be the difference here. So, of course, a big, big thing in rendering has always been water. How do you do realistic water? And I think for the time that the first Ratchet game was made, the water here is actually pretty decent. It has transparency, it has kind of differences in the height of the water, which is meant to emulate waves, and it also has kind of foam scattered around. However, it doesn't really look like water still, because water is an extremely complex thing. And one of the most important things that go into making water realistic is refraction. 
This means the way that light scatters when it hits the water and kind of distorts everything underneath. This makes water look like actual fluid instead of just kind of a transparent glass-like surface. And also, of course, there are lots of foam particle effects being added here. And you will also see that they've kind of implemented into this water shader the fact that it should create foam lines whenever it intersects with other objects. This is actually something that we tried to create recently on this channel, and it's actually not that difficult with modern technology. So overall, I think what makes the difference between old Ratchet and Clank and the new one is that they've kept the same art style and stay true to that, which I really, really like, but they run it through kind of a more realistic, physically based actually, even though it's not a realistic, physically based game, renderer. So that gives this really high-end looking graphics, but still in the same old Ratchet and Clank style. I think another example of a game doing this is Overwatch. Of course, Overwatch is a new game, but they've done the same thing in creating a really stylized look and a really stylized aesthetic run through a realistic renderer. And I personally really like the outcome of that. All right, so what's next? Ooh, all right, you guys are really treating me with this one. So another game that I really like is actually Hearthstone. And this is for a plethora of reasons, but one of them is that I think it's a genius way of combining 2D and 3D elements. Because when creating a virtual card game, you're kind of faced with the question of how do you make something two-dimensional like a playing card feel real and lifelike in a virtual environment? And I think that's exactly what they've done here. The board itself is actually entirely 3D, everything from the card stack to the buttons to the 3D buildings on the environment. And the cards themselves, however, are 2D. But because of the way that they're combined with 3D elements in a three-dimensional scene, they start to feel way more real. And I think they use many subtle tricks to establish this feel. I mean, the cards themselves are being drawn from the deck using a three-dimensional animation. The card backs actually have 3D applied to them, uh, whether this is a shader or an actual 3D mesh. I don't know, but it definitely gives the impression. And if you notice, the cards actually cast 3D shadows onto the three-dimensional environment. So they feel part of this physical scene. Because of this, I think Hearthstone just feels more real and alive than any other card game that I've tried. And it also helps bring the characters in these cards to life in this environment. And fun fact, Hearthstone is built using the Unity game engine. So a game engine is pretty much just a piece of software that runs underneath any game and kind of specified how the game should be run. It registers input from the player. It is responsible for drawing graphics. So depending on the game engine, you'll be able to achieve different levels of quality and a bunch of other stuff like networking and sound and so on. And if you haven't watched this channel before, the cool thing about Unity is that it's a standalone game engine and it's available for free. Why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because Blizzard is a huge company and normally they are creating game engines from scratch for their games, which takes maybe 200 employees just to make a fairly simple thing work. However, because they chose to use Unity for Hearthstone, they were able to do it with a team of around 15 people. And if you have yet to try out game development yourself, this is actually pretty great news because you can download Unity today and get started. In fact, we have a bunch of videos on this channel that shows you how to get started using it and making some simple games. And trust me, you don't need 15 people to do that. Also, if you want to try out game development, but maybe don't trust yourself with just watching tutorials, we're collaborating with an awesome guy called Jason Wyman. Jason is offering courses where you get to work alongside other students and always have access to one-on-one -on -one help from Jason himself. I think this is a really cool way to learn and Jason has courses that cover everything from the very fundamentals of game dev to highly professional workflows. Right now we offer the first 50 people who sign up a free t-shirt from Line of Code, a big discount as well as other bonuses on the courses. Okay, so PUBG. Well, first of all, I can start by saying that PUBG is created with another standalone engine called Unreal Engine 4 and it's known for creating some of the most beautiful looking graphics in the industry. However, personally, I'm maybe not the biggest fan of the art direction on PUBG. So remember, whenever you're trying to create a realistic look, it's going to be really taxing on the hardware. 
And we are also making a battle royale, which is a huge technical challenge, I think you're kind of setting yourself up for some failure. And just watching this, something tells me that they've had to cut some corners, either because of technical limitations or just because of time restrictions. So let's try and break this down. So right away in this clip here, we can see the character falling towards the ground and there's a distinct lack of shadows and lighting information. Everything seems extremely flat and especially the coastline uh, kind of catches the eye. Um, the water is a very uniform dark blue, which is somewhat okay, but near the coastline we should always see foam patching up and you should be able to see a nice blend from the rocky sand to the water itself. Yeah, this, this clip definitely also reveals a lot. So the very first thing that I see here is something is wrong with the lighting. This building here seems to be completely unlit or at least lighting is very much not clear on it. There are no contact shadows, what we refer to as ambient occlusion. And this is what happens when two objects are intersecting or get really close to each other. Light gets kind of caught between the two objects and is unable to escape. And therefore, whenever two objects are close, we kind of see a shadow between them. This is not really visible here, which means that the object don't feel part of the scene. They kind of feel like they're floating on top of the ground, which gives a very unrealistic appearance. You can also see a distinct lack of normal maps. So normal maps is a technology used to try and create more three dimensional detail than what you can do with a 3D model, because you can only put so much detail in there and your computer will start to cramp up. So instead you use normal maps, which are basically just images of what we call textures that you apply onto an object containing information about kind of the ups and downs and the bumps and crevices of the surface. And what we can then do with this is instead of actually having this detail on the model, we can just whenever a light shines onto the object, use this normal map to tell us how we can bend this light a tiny bit to kind of simulate that detail being there. This doesn't work if you're viewing an object from the side, because then the texture will just be completely flat and the detail won't be there. But if you're viewing it at kind of an angle, it can start to look really realistic. However, here we definitely see a lack of that because all the surfaces look extremely flat. In fact, I don't see much more than just color detail here. And the bricks on the wall seem to be, well, kind of painted on. It also seems to be kind of low definition textures overall that are just slapped onto objects. Again, we're seeing some problems here with the metallicness of some of these surfaces. It looks like the metallicness of each object is defined for the entire object. However, I would recommend for something like this using a metallic map. This is also a texture, just like we have a colored texture and we have a normal texture, we would also put a third texture, which is a metallic texture. And this just defines what parts of the object should look metallic and reflect a lot of light and what parts shouldn't. And if we look inside this building, we also see that there is really poor to no indoor lighting. And indoor lighting is extremely difficult, especially if you're trying to save on performance, because normally you will just have one big directional light, which is the sun. And every time you then have an interior, that is just gonna be completely dark. You're gonna have no shadows in there because the sun is not gonna be casting shadows inside the building. At least if it is, it's gonna look really unrealistic. So you need to start thinking about how to light your interiors with extra lights and that way you can really quickly bloat your scene with all these point lights that are rendering inside of your houses and you're never able to see them unless you actually enter. So that's a lot of performance optimization that needs to be done there where you make sure you don't actually render these lights unless you look inside the building, which is not an easy thing to do. You can also kind of pre-calculate lighting, which is a technique that a lot of games use if the conditions of your scene isn't going to change. Some food for thought there. This can definitely be improved. However, I have seen much worse cases of trying to go for a realistic look and there just not being enough time and resources. And actually this part here looks much better. I don't know if this is a different or newer map, but this has metallic maps. The lighting looks to be way, way better. The detail on the ground here tells me that there are proper normal maps being applied. This looks really, really good. So. Well done. All right, what's next? Oh, okay, so Fortnite. So of course you can't talk about PUBG without mentioning Fortnite. And this is not only because these games are both 
Battle Royale, it's actually because they're made with the same game engine. Fortnite is also made with Unreal Engine 4. And this tells you kind of the power of some of these standalone game engines because they're extremely versatile. These two games, although they share similarities in gameplay, have a very, very different aesthetic. And I personally think that Fortnite is an example of really good art direction because they're realistic with what they're trying to accomplish. So first of all, everything in Fortnite looks very balanced. I really like the aesthetic that they're going for here. The lighting seems to be playing off of the colors in a really, really nice way. They have some really solid post-processing going, which is basically like image effects that make everything blend together. It's just a very balanced visual appearance. And I think the number one reason why this works so well is because they're using something called hand-painted textures. So again, the textures are the images that we slap onto objects in order to give them color. And in the case of PUBG, they're using real life images for this. So you might go out, you take an image of a brick wall and you just slap that onto your 3D model and you have a texture. That's the most simple way. Again, you can combine this with normal maps and all these other kinds of scans for increased detail. However, that is the very simple idea. For Fortnite, they haven't used real life images for this because they're going for that stylized look. Instead, they're using, well, hand-painted textures, which is just what the word sounds like. It's someone going into Photoshop or some other 2D image editing software and drawing out the textures by hand. This can be a pretty tedious process, but it also means that you get to save a lot on performance. Because whenever you're hand-painting textures, you can make a lot of assumptions about how you want your lighting to look. And so you can paint in, just digitally by hand, you can paint in highlights, shadows, and crevices, and this helps everything pop without having to rely on the renderer to give you this detail, which just gives a really cool look in my opinion. Also, the cool thing about hand-painted textures is that because they have less detail than a real-life image, there's a lot of detail in real life, you can actually decrease the resolution of them quite a lot without having them look washed out or just outright bad. And that definitely helps to their advantage whenever you're creating something like a battle royale. So I think you can see this, especially on surfaces that are very flat, like rocks, you can see all of the different brush strokes that went into creating these textures and also stuff like wood. Now comparing PUBG to Fortnite is actually also interesting in another way. And that's because there was quite a bit of controversy when Fortnite came out. That's because not only are these two games made with the same engine, but the company that made Fortnite, Epic Games, is actually also the company behind the Unreal Engine. And they're the one licensing it out to the creators of PUBG. So all of a sudden you have this really complex relationship where a company creates an engine and gives another company permission to use this, of course, at a cost. This company creates something really cool and interesting this other company sees it and because they own the engine and have access to all this information about what this other company is doing, they can maybe, you know, speed up the process a little bit and create something fairly similar in terms of gameplay really, really quickly. So that was kind of the moral argument at the time. And it's really interesting how these standalone game engines that are being shared between all these different game development studios are being used. So that's pretty much all the clips and that is my opinion on some of these games. If you like this format and would like us to continue it, definitely let us know. And also definitely write if there's something specific that you would like us to break down. Also, don't forget to check out Jason's courses. Simply click the link in the description to get started. And other than that, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Thanks to all the awesome Patreon supporters who donated in July, and a special thanks to Infinity PPR, Dennis Sullivan, Lost to Violence, Love Forever, Chris, Faisal Marify, David Lipka, Leo Set, Runen, Daniel Tosanic, Jacob Sanford, Constantinus Kurenzas, Naoki Wasaki, Gregory Pierce, Alison the Fierce, Erasmus, and Kul Swiderski. You guys rock!